when the UK kind of blew up, which was immediately after, really, or almost at the same time, there was a different vibe, and we were really, you know, my friends and I were really interested in that, curious as to how, how does this same kind of thing, uh, how is it expressed in a, in a somewhat different cultural climate? My mother called me and said, punk started in England. And I'm like, oh, mom. <laughs> The political social climate at the time in the 70s was crucial to the formation of punk rock because uh, punk rock was talking about the dole queue and the winter of discontent. The fabric of society at that time was like when we first started, it was in our eyes was falling apart. We had a three day week, you had rubbish strikes. You know, everywhere you went, it was like bad news. They were talking about burying people in the, at sea in the Mersey because the grave triggers were on site. I mean, it was that bad. God save the Queen! The time was just right. It, it wasn't orchestrated. It was like all, the, uh, all these elements of people not being happy with what was going on at present. So I suppose that probably had uh, quite a strong um, push for all of us to say, well, we better do something for ourselves rather than... Uh, rely on anybody else. God save the queen! She ain't no human being! And there's no future in England's dream. Well, there was no such word as punk at the time, if I remember. Uh, the first time I heard that word used in, in conjunction with what, what we were doing was, uh, I think it was Caroline Kuhn or one of these uh, journos. Um, and I, I, was, I was a little bit shocked, to be quite honest, because, uh, you know, I thought we were kind of, you know, I, I didn't really know what we were doing. All I knew, it was kind of different from the, the garbage that was going around at the time. <laughs> Seventy six. I mean, the place to be was, you know, the King's Road. It was the only place that was interesting. The one thing that would draw us to the King's Road was Vivian and Malcolm's shop. That was the one thing you had to go and see and hang out in. I'd never seen anyone who'd looked like this ever before in my life. She had just, just this white, this white hair that just kind of stuck out all over the place and these pu purple eyebrows drawn on. And I'd never met anyone like Malcolm and Vivian because they looked so fucking bizarre for a start. People like Vivian Westwood are a kind of social sponge. I don't mean she sponges as in leech. I mean sponge as in she soaks up what's going on. The, the, the mood line, you know, she kind of feeds, feels all the political and economic moods and then translates it in, into her clothes and everything. The trousers all come with a little loincloth on the back. Everybody wants to know what that's for. It's just a loincloth. It's just a gesture of some kind of tribalism, really. You could always point out that maybe this, it's got some connection with the fact that this zip goes right round the back up the arse as well, I don't know. First time I went into Malcolm's store here in England and I saw these bondage pants, you know, where they had straps on them where you're supposed to like strap your legs together. And it seemed like the dumbest idea in the world to me. I mean, how are you going to walk? Just kind of bounce, bounce down the street? And I thought, nobody's going to wear that. And I came back to England about six months later and there were all these kids with their legs strapped together bouncing down the street. <laughs> I don't think punk would have happened without Malcolm and Vivian, to be honest. Something would have happened, and it might have even been called punk, but it wouldn't have looked the way it did. And the look of it was so important. Saturday afternoon, people used to flip between Acme Attractions and um, Let It Rock. And John was one of that crowd. We arranged this meeting for him to come down to meet us for a drink. And he got the gig. He said, what are you called? He said, the Sex Pistols. He said, that's awful. It's so bad. I love it. I am an antichrist. I am an antichrist. We'd been reading about the Sex Pistols in the NME, a, a gig at the St. Martin's College of Art, I think it was. The one where somebody shouted out from the audience, you can't play. And one of them said, uh, so what? We read the first um, review of the Sex Pistols in NME. Don't look over your shoulder, the Sex Pistols are coming. And he said, oh look, there's a review here for this band in London who do Stooges songs. Nobody did Stooges songs. They do a version of an old fun. And we thought, oh. And there was this fantastic line of, well, we're not into music, we're into chaos. Oh, which appealed to Howard. And it was those two things that, that kind of went ding, ding, with me. 
We successfully saw them twice the weekend we came down to London, February 1976. Uh, I said to Malcolm, uh, do you want to come and play at our college? About 100 people turned up, um, and I think we know that included Morrissey, half of Joy Division and New Order. Apparently everybody in that audience started a band. Uh, all seven million of them. <laughs> The 100 Club Punk Rock Festival was a two-day event that featured bands like The Pistols, The Damned, The Clash, Subway Sect and Susie and the Banshees. I think that my first reaction when I went down into the 100 Club was, I can't believe they've taken this all seriously. The formation of the bands was quite liquid, you know. You, you, one minute Tony James would be in the damned, and the next minute, you know, Chrissy Hind would, you know, we'd all be work, feeling each other and uh, seeing how it went, kind of thing. So, um, Chrissy was in a, uh, an early incarnation of the damned, uh, which she, she wanted to call it um, Mike Hunt's Honourable Discharge. Um, a charming name. I've got a new rose, I've got a good. Yes, I knew that, I always would. They were more like a, an American punk band than the London bands, which were unfortunately, they didn't always have a great sense of humor. We used to jump from, you know, top of tall building to another tall building to steal a flag, you know, or, or, to, or to get in someone else's hotel room to shit in their bed, you know. The, these things don't happen anymore, unfortunately, you know. I remember going to see Damned, I think, and I'm walking back with Mark P, who had just started this, was starting this fanzine, Sniffing Glue. You've got to get out there and shove it down people's throats, your ideas, and if it means being a, a bit violent, you know? So, OK, you know? Sniffing Glue, obviously, was like the first the Xerox copy fanzine. It was like an expression of our own thing rather than this more glossy American magazines, you know? The first issue of Sniffing Glue put Blue Oyster Cult on the cover, then had the Sex Pistols on the cover. Yeah, The Clash, The Damned and The Pistols were all about the same kind of fame, stroke, notoriety, whatever you want to call it at the time, uh, until The Pistols were uh, lucky enough to be invited on the, the Grundy show. I mean, anyone could have gone on and swore. Joe Strummer could have done it, I could have. I'm very good at swearing, you know. Go on, you've got another five you seconds. Say something outrageous. You dirty bastard. Go on, again. <laughs> you dirty fucker. What a clever boy. What a yeah. fucking rotter. Well, that's it for tonight. I'll be seeing you soon. I hope I'm not seeing you again. From me, though, good night. <laughs> I'm going to complain to ITV. I really can't believe the reaction that it had, that, you know, people kicked their TV sets in and were outraged, the filth and the fury. I mean, you could never predict that that would go so ballistic. That's how they leapt across uh, in, in the old uh, fame states, and they, and they were the kind of it was the filth and the fury and the front pages and all this stuff. I am an anti I am an don't know what I want, but I know how to get it. I want to destroy, pass the Went completely mad from that point on, and we all, like, set off. I think we, the next day we set off on the Anarchy Tour, um, the Pistols, ourselves, and uh, Johnny Thunder and the Heartbreakers. I think we, we had like 16 dates booked, and uh, as we went up the motorway, the, the, the dates got less and less, and uh, I think we ended up doing only four, and then it was back in time, just in time for Christmas. Do you feel the publicity following the Thames Television interview has been damaging, or do you think it's helped you? I don't think it's been damaging, far from it. Whether it's helping us is another matter. You know, 
know, a lot of shit had gone down and things going to head between me and John. I kind of had enough at that stage. Pistols Mark II with Sid, bad mistake. Nancy went over to England because uh, Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers came over and she was good friends with them and she met Sid and it was apparently love at first sight. But they were really bad for each other because Nancy was, you know, on the dope when, for a long time. I saw the transition of what that drug can do to people and courtesy of that horrible girl, Nancy Spongen. I just saw him completely change. <laughs> I love the Pistols because of their, again, like the Ramones, although in a, in a very not American way, the Pistols were incredibly reductive to emotions, anger, three chords, you know, just the kind of damaged sound of rock and roll being very reduced was so beautiful to me. It became clear that uh, lyrics were very important to these bands, you know, they were, they were dealing with... Um you know, everyday matters in a in a in a very um, erudite and poetic fashion. I thought, especially when you got to read the, you know, uh, Joe Strummer's lyrics and things like that. You know, steel shoes on the stone cold floor. I hear the screws screaming in the corridor. The bad news and the slamming of the doors. What did I do? And the what am I here for? I took my existing poems and uh, and read them at breakneck speed, you know, because it seemed to me that it was part of the uh, part of the house style of punk was uh, was fast, you know, you had to you had to be fast. A lot of the influences uh, for the English punk scene were really uh, mostly homegrown, really. A kind of glam bands like Ziggy Stardust, which is David Bowie and the Spiders from Mars, and Mott the Hoople and the sensational Alex Harvey band. Tony James and I had a band called London SS. That was like kind of before the clash, and we used to put an advert in the Melody Maker every week saying anybody who's into the Stooges and the MC5 and the New York Dolls should get in touch with us. Bernie brought in this kid one day, too good looking, I thought, to be in the band, um, and was an art student, and it was Paul Simon. And, and I thought, I looked at Paul and Mick together and I thought, oh, I gotta get out of this now because you know they, I could see they were made for each other. It was essentially uh, Tony James playing bass, Mick Jones guitar, and Brian James on guitar. They formed the bands like The Damned, Generation X, The Pretenders, and of course, The Clash. And we started the first Clash album, and uh, we didn't really want to know anything, and so we just did what we thought. We played our tracks that we had, a few tracks that we had basically our set before we made a record. Everybody sees the second record, give them enough rope as a transitional record. And in that time we we go to loads of places we've never been before and uh, see a lot of the world that we hadn't seen before and all that goes in towards our third record, London Calling, which is uh, sort of like when we come into our own way. Pistols were like really angry and loud and just yelling about it, whereas the Clash were angry and loud but questioning about it. And whereas the Pistols would just like scream about how, you know, something was wrong, the Clash would kind of say, well, this is wrong, but what are you going to do about it? We're a garage band. Oh, we come from garage land. Oh, oh, oh. I remember there were a lot of places that wouldn't let us play up and down the country, universities. 
and and that was probably something that they'd read that we we had a song called White Riot. They thought we were some sort of national front group, whereas really the song was about white people getting up and doing it for themselves because uh, our black neighbours were doing it for themselves in so far as the riots and whatever. So it was time for, for the white people to get on with their own situation. Things got a bit serious after a couple of years when Martin Webster's National Front started coming to punk gigs and trying to recruit people. I think that's why we played the Rock Against Racism gig, just to sort of make it clear that we're actually, we're on this side of the fence, we're not over there. What people called the politicisation of the, of the clash was, came from two things. I would say that Bernard said to us that we should write about what we know about. And the, the second thing was the way that Joe was, he was always thinking about things like that. Strummer thought of the world and the potential of, of music as like a, a, you know, he's always making references to radio broadcasts and, you know, this one's going out to, to the world. He had that kind of Woody Guthrie thing or a kind of thing that Dylan had and Bob Marley had and, and sometimes John Lennon had, where they, they were aware of that power, but they weren't egotistical about it. And he had this sense, and he knew, and it was true, that something he would think of in a small, in his basement in Ladbroke Grove, had the potential of affecting, you know, young people particularly, all over the planet. No, you're right. July of 76 we went to um, uh, London and uh, we played uh, the roundhouse. I couldn't believe it. I said this is the audience that the Ramones deserve. This is the audience that this music needs. This is the other half. It was just like totally like uh, really short songs, really hard attack, no nonsense and it was just like cut down bare to the bone, you know, and it was that, that was inspiring. There were members of The Clash, The Sex Pistols. Sid Vicious learned how to play the guitar by listening to the Ramones and just staying up for three nights on speed and playing along to Ramones records. And the Ramones were the one band, I think, that the English punks kind of looked up to. And I remember saying to Joey, and he was like, oh, they really liked us in England. I was like, yeah, but who cares? It's England, you know?